Hello, my name is Rachel Sanchez and I'm a research fellow at Gonville and Keys and an affiliate lecturer in the Department of Sociology at the University of Cambridge. I'm also one of the conveners of the Reproductive Justice Research Network alongside Katie Dow, Aidino Shocknessy, Julieta Chaparro, and Sofia Ugarte. Today, we will be talking with Professor Veronique Motier, a fellow and director of studies at Jesus College, University of Cambridge, and professor of sociology at the University of Lausanne. Before I introduce this talk, I wanted to add that this video is more edited than others as there was a neo-Nazi incident. This event was subjected to intrusion by a number of neo-Nazi trolls who attempted to take control of the proceedings, in, uh, including drawing sexually explicit images on top of Professor Veronique Moutier's presentation, <clears throat> putting loud music on, posting neo-Nazi slurs in the chat box, and targeting their speaker personally with sexually violent taunts, including rape threats. We at the Reproductive Justice Research Network are deeply sorry to any of our audience members who may have been triggered by these events. We would also like to take this opportunity to formally apologize to Professor Motier. This is the first time that our events uh, or our network in general has been subjected to such an attack. Moving forward, we will be taking a number of measures to protect and safeguard our presenters and audience members including dis disabling certain Zoom functions for our upcoming events. Our goal here is to maintain a safe, democratic and accessible forum for debate, discussion and collaboration. In this vein, violent and abusive behaviors will not be tolerated by this platform. Having said this, we hope you enjoyed this talk. And if you haven't done so already, please do not forget to like, comment and subscribe to this channel. And additionally, if you haven't done so already, please do follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Reproductive Justice Cam. Thank you very much. Um, as you can see from the very annoying voice, uh, this event will be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel. So if you want to turn off your cameras, like feel free to do so. Additionally, if you would like to ask a question but don't want it to go into the final recording, please do let me know so I can edit that out. Uh, so this event is titled Eugenics and the Quest for Reparative Justice. Today we will be focusing on the Swiss case uh, with our fantastic speaker, uh, Professor Veronique Moutier. Uh, Veronique Moutier is a fellow and director of studies at Jesus College, University of Cambridge, and professor in sociology at the University of Lausanne since 2006. And I should add that she was my faculty advisor during my PhD and helped me greatly throughout my PhD process. Um, her research and thesis interests are in the areas of uh, social and political theory, uh, historical and political sociology, gender, sexuality, and race, feminist theory, welfare states, and social exclusion, core sterilization policies and child removal programs, and research methods, specifically discourse theory and analysis. In this vein, she has published extensively on eugenic practices and ideas and the ways in which this has been put in place in the Swiss case, as well as other contexts. And without further ado, I'll leave the floor to Veronique. Uh, Veronique, thank you so much for being with us today. First of all, Rachel, thank you so much for your generous introduction. It's a real pleasure to be speaking in your, in your series today. And um, today I'm going to talk a bit about the Swiss case, but um, I'm going to not so much focus on the historic experience of eugenic practices in Switzerland, which is what most of my, uh, a lot of my published work has been on. I'm rather to, um, instead of that, I'm going to use that uh, historic case as a way of thinking about contemporary issues of reparation, uh, of um, acknowledgement, um, uh, reparative justice, and, and, and so on. Uh, so the, the title of my presentation is Eugenics and the Quest for Reparative Justice, with a specific focus on the Swiss case. Um, I'm assuming that within the, the network, uh, the research network on um, uh, reproductive justice, I don't need to explain for too long what eugenics is, but there may be some, some viewers afterwards for whom that's a little bit, little bit new. So uh, in, a, in a nutshell, uh, eugenics was a, a, a body of theories, initially emerged as a body of uh, self-proclaimed scientific theories about heredity uh, that were concerned with how to improve not so much the quantity, but the, the quality of the nation. 
So um, with people like Francis Gelton uh, in the 1880s, this very quickly turned towards a preoccupation with how to improve the quality of the national race. Uh, so it was very heavily intertwined with uh, questions of racial purity, racial quality, and, and so on. Um, the, in terms of the scientific discourse, uh, this became very quickly an international, uh, an international discourse. There's a lot of debate in literature about how uh, international it was, whether we should really adopt this model of uh, eugenics uh, originating in the UK and then spreading to the rest of the world, or whether there were also national uh, points of, of um, uh, emergence of uh, exactly the same kind of ideas. That's not the debate I want to have today, although it's, it's very interesting in itself. Uh, today suffice it to say that these ideas spread, they were uh, legitimized at the time, they, were, they, had, uh, they enjoyed scientific respectability, but they also had clear policy ambitions. They were also very much directed at national governments, where eugenic scientists had the ambition to uh, advise national governments in the implementation of national programs and policy programs, including programs of forced sterilizations. So in the Swiss case, uh, one of the most famous international eugenicists of Swiss origins uh, was Auguste Forel, who was also a great figurehead of the Swiss socialist movement. Uh, here's a photo of him. He was a psychiatrist, late 19th century psychiatrist and sexologist, uh, later appeared on uh, the biggest banknote that exists in the Swiss situation, that is the banknote of thousand francs, which was a sign of the kind of public respectability that he, that he and recognition that he enjoyed. Uh, he was um, a very important author writing on sexuality, particularly on female sexuality, uh, but also um, a very important contributor to eugenic ideas. Uh, in his uh, writings, uh, like other eugenicists, he attributed to women a particularly active role uh, in the eugenic movement and also in the implementation of eugenic policy. So uh, in his view, uh, women who were educated, who were particularly educated in eugenic ideas, would um, take on a particularly active role uh, in implementing these eugenic ideas about, for example, how to choose the right uh, spouse uh, and who to reproduce with. So in that respect, he attributed to women a much more active social role than was common at the time, because this was, of course, at the time when the social role of women in the Swiss case was particularly weak. And in that respect, Switzerland remained uh, um, an exceptional case in the sense that uh, we, at the federal level, at the national level, in the Swiss context, women didn't even uh, get the right to vote until 1971. So it's uh, in that respect, uh, a country which stayed for an exceptionally long time, um, particularly gender, gender unequal. Um, so like, other, like many other eugenicists, uh, Forel worked in psychiatric clinics, so um, the, the targets of eugenic sterilization, for example, were often women who were incarcerated in psychiatric clinics, women who had been labeled as morally defective, as mentally defective, as uh, suffering from mental illness. Uh, all of those labels uh, were at the time much looser, much more catch-all labels than they are today. That's an important thing to, to bear in mind. So under the heading of under the, the category, the diagnostic of mental illness, fell a range of uh, behaviors that were outside of the, of the norm. So that could range from a woman who had children out of wedlock, which was a clear sign of uh, moral degeneracy, uh, to women who were uh, not who were considered as uh, very bad housekeepers, whose household was very messy. They could also uh, be portrayed as suffering from mental defectiveness and, and uh, from biological inf and mental inferiority. Um, so in the um, reproductive research network and also in reproductive research more generally, um, eugenics has been often analyzed from the point of view of notions of sexual and reproduct reproductive rights. Uh, where, of course, we can retrace the history of sexual and reproductive rights as a notion that emerges at a particular moment um, a few decades ago, um, um, and which is often conceptualized at, at an individual level, the idea that, that uh, women and men have you know, certain reproductive You're rights. So that, uh, historic practices of eugenics have often been analyzed through the prism of notions of rights, individual rights, and the notion of reproductive freedom, the, the freedom not to procreate, the freedom to procreate, which of course um, 
uh, particularly in terms of freedom to procreate, have been heavily um, uh, hampered by, uh, by eugenic practices such as uh, forced sterilization, um, with a more critical concept of reproductive justice emerging as a way to shift the thinking from a focus on individual rights uh, to uh, taking into account the collective structures uh, of reproductive oppression. Now, today I want to focus not so much on, on these issues, although they will come back at the end, as you will see, we'll think about how uh, issues of reparative justice are also impacted by these collective structures of reproductive oppression. But I want to focus really on uh, uh, present uh, attempts to um, engage in processes of reparative justice. Uh, so turning towards the past, um, Eugenics has been a, a very fertile ground for thinking about how agency works, how resistance works, with people like Johanna Schoen, for example, pointing out that um, a, a certain uh, an amount of um, uh, people have been labeled as victims of eugenic sterilization may well have also been exercising agency by using the possibility to um, access uh, practice such as abortion and sterilization at a time when this was extremely restricted and almost impossible. Uh, and at the same time, of course, we have to remember that those were extreme minorities in terms of numbers. So there's been sometimes um, uh, an assumption that that concerns the majority uh, of, of uh, victims of eugenic practices, which would be historically completely incorrect. Uh, so in the rest of my talk, I will really turn towards today and ask the question of how have these uh, historic practices um, of eugenic sterilization in particular, uh, given rise in uh, present times to, uh, to campaigns for uh, reparative justice, and how have those campaigns fared in comparison to other campaigns for reparative justice? And uh, this I will think through only in the Swiss case, but in the discussion it would be really interesting to open it up, because those trajectories uh, and the respective recognition or lack of recognition of different categories of victims, the hierarchization of different categories of victims that we're witnessing in the Swiss case has not taken the same form in, in some other national context. So the notion of reparative justice itself is of course highly problematic um, as such, and yet it's a critical concept which is, is useful to use. So uh, basically what we mean with reparative justice is the attempt to repair in some way the harms that were done with respect to eugenic sterilization, that would be the harm done by eugenic sterilizations. So you immediately see the limits of the concept because uh, in terms of with respect to interventions on women's bodies, uh, it's of course uh, impossible to undo this harm uh, and even to repair it uh, physically or to repair it biologically is, is equally impossible to do. So we're talking about situations where there has been extreme bodily harm, uh, bodily violence, uh, and yet there are in, in the activist campaigns there have been, uh, the, the accent has been put more on other forms of reparative justice, and of course recognition, acknowledgement, uh, official policies, etc. are part of that whole sort of tool set uh, of, of activist claims that have been put, put forward. Um, the general um, thinking about reparative justice is that, uh, and here I'm simply borrowing this, I'm adapting this from uh, the United Nations um, Organizations for Gender Equality, who point out that it has to be responsive to context, to lived reality, and it has to be a foundation for justice and a more inclusive future. So what we retain from this, what we, what we can take from this is that uh, notions of reparative justice tend to not only be looking towards the past, but also towards the future that the, one of the points of repair of trying to obtain some form of repair to justice is to try to build a more inclusive future uh, and not only to acknowledge uh, past historic wrongs, no matter how important those were and no matter how important that moment of acknowledgement of a past historic wrong in itself is. So in the Swiss case, like in other contexts, uh, a quick chronology first. So the rise of eugenic science happened from roughly from the mid 1880s. Then from the late 1920s, the practical influence on policymaking starts to intensify, uh, particularly in the, in the field of uh, educational policies and also in the field of eugenic sterilization laws, where, um, for example, in the educational field, uh, the Swiss, as, as other countries did, started to develop uh, 
uh, educational materials which aim to teach um, school children about their eugenic responsibility towards the nation. So uh, the, the underlying aim here was to encourage the reproduction between citizens of superior quality, uh, citizens who were, according to the eugenic criteria, considered to be of superior quality. That is, uh, and we can define it most easily by the negatives, people who are not disabled, not labeled mentally ill, uh, not fall outside of, uh, outside of any sexual norms at the time, who don't fall outside of gender norms, norms uh, at the time. And uh, this was also very heavily class-based, so uh, mostly people from middle and, and upper classes uh, were, of course, considered to, to be of superior quality. I'll talk about racialization of all of this in a moment as well. There's also a lot of racialization going on. Uh, so one example of this kind of school material is, uh, this was an example of material shown in, in Swiss German schools, uh, where you can see a very pedagogic, uh, very pedagogic representation of uh, couples, of course, very heteronormative, um, where it says, the text in German says, uh, every uh, eight Swiss men marries a, a foreign woman. So we also see a heavily gendered discourse. The act of choosing a spouse is an act exercised by the man. Um, and then the text goes on to say, this is a bit, uh, this is somewhat disappointing for the eight Swiss woman. Uh, subtext because she will remain single, which was, of course, a very sad fate for a woman in those years. Um, uh, the, um, and then going back to the text, text says this constant feeding of new blood into our uh, national being is good for the health, but also for uh, the mental strength of the, um, uh, the, the, the Swiss uh, spirit. So when you look at the picture at the end, you see how the, who those desirable foreigners are and there you see the little Nazi flag so this is just before the second world war where uh, the, the influx of uh, in particular German uh, migrants of course not of Jewish uh, background but because they would, would be considered inferior they would be classified as inferior but uh, so sort that of Aryan uh, Aryan um, uh, Germans uh, represented here by the Nazi flag uh, were seen as actually improving the Swiss national race so here we see an example of this Positive eugenics. Positive eugenics was a term that the eugenicists themselves used, not one that we as researchers use. So this was about encouraging uh, marriage with particular superior categories of the population. The negative eugenics um, uh, was about preventing reproduction by inferior categories of um, uh, citizens, um, where Switzerland was the first context in the European uh, on the European continent to introduce a European uh, sorry, a, a eugenic sterilization law in 1928 in one of the Swiss cantons, one of the Swiss provinces, which happened to be Auguste Forel's own province. So that also reflects his, his influence. Um, so this is, this is an example of negative eugenics, where it was about uh, stopping uh, Swiss citizens from reproducing with um, uh, categories of the population that were labeled as, as inferior. And here we find uh, in the, the writings of eugenic scientists at the time, these are publications published by psychiatrists, uh, eugenic psychiatrists at the time, uh, we find uh, an example not just of this uh, inferiorization of certain uh, social categories, but also a clear racialization going on. And I'll explain to you in a moment why. So here we have firstly the good choice of, of spouse. So this is a, the, the significance of the, um, the good choice. Uh, it's called fam family primo. So this is the good family with a visual representation of you know, fairly conventional uh, bourgeois looking uh, father and mother and two children, where the text says marriage in a, um, in a healthy and decent family offers the best guarantee for um, an offspring of good quality. Uh, healthy children are a source of um, uh, pride to their parents and they're the best guarantee for a happy uh, marriage. So that's the text at the bottom. And then here you have a, 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 a genealogical tree, which is a very common uh, tool also used by eugenic scientists to sort of convey this idea that what uh, we sociologists consider as a social transmission of um, uh, status, the, the social transmission of social status, the fact that across several generations, we often see the same kind of professions coming up because of all sorts of class effects. Uh, in the eugenic discourse, this was of course seen as proof of the biological superiority uh, of uh, the eugenically superior categories of the population. 
so here we have the bad choice, and this is the family primo, as it's uh, sorry, sorry, the family zero, as it says at the bottom. So the family uh, zero, um, here the text says one single wrong marriage often means, and here they use the German word entartung. Now the word entartung is quite powerful. This was the word that the, the Nazi Germans used to talk about degeneracy. So, um, so they're saying one single wrong marriage means a degeneracy uh, of the, the offspring in the next generations. And of course, the connotation of uh, entartung is that it's not just at the individual level of the family, but also at the national level. So this is also the entire nation, which is at risk of becoming uh, weaker and uh, being, uh, being um, uh, suffering from this influx of bad blood. Now, who was this family zero? And um, uh, this is explained in the scientific text, which uh, accompanies these, these drawings. Uh, the family zero was a family of Yenis. Now, what were the Yenis? The Yenis were, uh, or are, I should say, uh, an ethnic minority in Switzerland who are uh, nomadic. Uh, they're itinerant, traditionally. Uh, they, um, that you, could, you could say the equivalent of travelers today uh, in, in, in the UK. Uh, they tend to travel amongst um, Germany, Switzerland, Austria, and, and the Netherlands. So they were, they were nomadic at the time. They have been sedent, forcibly set into rest since. Um, and Yenis became the object of uh, a eugenically inspired policy program called Kinder der Landstrafe, mean, Landstrafe meaning literally children of the country lanes, uh, a program which ran from 1926 to 1973, in which uh, an agency funded by the Swiss state uh, called uh, Pro Juventute uh, forcibly removed uh, about 600 children from their families. Um, on the basis of uh, a, a rhetoric which mixed social arguments with racial and biological arguments. So in other words, the Yenis were racialized. They were portrayed by uh, the psychiatric racial theorist at the time as biologically different, as part of an inferior race. And uh, they were, in terms of policy uh, rhetoric, uh, considered a, a national problem because they were because they were not sedentary, so they escaped the control of the national state. Uh, they were by definition always in flux, always traveling, sometimes in the country, sometimes out of the country. So they were in Sigmund Bauman's term trouble. They troubled the national boundaries. Um, and in the rhetoric of the time, in the rhetoric used by Proventute, the state agency that was in charge of dealing with the Yenish problem, they were presented as um, asocial. So the term asocial was a very powerful, very often used term in German at the time, Swiss German at the time. Uh, and they were also portrayed as a, a dark stain on our national culture. Right? So we find also very sort of connotated language describing them. So this policy program was led for a long time uh, by someone called Alfred Siegfried, uh, who uh, presented the aims of this program, he, he, which he directed for several decades, as that of eliminating vacancy. So that was trying to solve the social program. program. Um, so that, that, um, it's in that context that uh, the state attempted to sedentarize the Yenis and to a large extent uh, succeeded, not completely, but to a large extent. Uh, but we also find the second goal here, which is really a very clearly uh, eugenic goal, and uh, which amounts to the destruction of Yenish culture. And that was the taking away the children from the Yenish families, um, preventing, as he put it, preventing the Yenish from reproducing without restraints, prevent them from bringing new generations of degenerate and abnormal children into the world. So they often became also victims of forced sterilization. And the child removal program aimed to take away the children who had already been born, uh, legitimized through a mix of arguments about uh, the inherent inferiority of their, of their parents, uh, which would be um, compensated by, uh, so that what it would be in the interest of the children to put them in state orphanages, in, in psychiatric clinics, or to put them uh, um, into a situation of forced work in Swiss farms. Uh, this was uh, presented as, uh, you know, this, this gives them a better chance in life with, of course, um, an incoherent uh, mix of that kind of rhetoric um, with the eugenic rhetoric of, but they will still always be uh, inherently defect, right, defective because they are themselves also racialized. Uh, so in that sense, they, they can, they're both presented as objects that need to be saved and as 
children who can never fully be Swiss and never fully be uh, um, uh, citizens. Uh, so these are some quite sinister photos of um, Siegfried literally leading away the Danish children because he would first take them for several months in his uh, in his home and then he would place them in um, in uh, state orphanages uh, and in farms and so on. These are other photos. This is him on the right on on the photo. Um, this program of forced removal of uh, children of the Danish. Um, echoed wider historical process, uh, practices, which um, uh, were much more widespread in Switzerland, which dealt with children from very poor families. So beyond the project, uh, beyond the program, which uh, targeted specifically uh, Yenis children, um, there was also a much wider set of practices to do with children from very poor families, typically a situation where the breadwinner dies young, or was never around to, to start with, where the local authorities become financially responsible for a family with children. And in those kind of situations, the local authorities could decide to place the children again in places where they would be put to work. So this was a very common practice in Switzerland up to the 1960s and 70s still, this was still very common, where children from poor families were placed by the state or by the local authorities, uh, particularly in farms, uh, where they were used as, as cheap labor. Uh, and this is called, uh, this category of children is, is called the Verdien Kinder. Now, the reason why I'm talking about both of these programs, uh, the first one was eugenic, the second one wasn't. And we're going to look now at how they fared in terms of claims for reparative justice, because there's some interesting differences there. Um, so if we now turn towards the restorative, um, uh, the, the contemporary activist campaigns that have been um, taking place since the 1980s, since the 1990s, for these different uh, categories of, uh, of, of victims. Um, what we see, what all of these activist campaigns have in common, is that they involve a critical uh, relationship to the national past. So they, they, they ask for, they request a, a critical reassessment of the national past. And in that sense, they're often very troubling. They're very troubling both for the authorities particularly in a country which hasn't traditionally had a great uh, uh, sort of cultural tradition of critical acknowledgement of, of past historic wrongs, such as, such as is true for the Swiss case. Um, so in other words, this critical, this request for a critical reassessment of its own national past goes together with a request for a transformation in the national identity. So it's asking for much more than only the specific uh, reparation claims that may be formulated. It involves necessarily, unavoidably, potentially much more. It involves a critical uh, transformation of, of the entire national identity and not just of the way um, uh, these particular groups of the population are treated or recognized or non-recognized today. Uh, the German term, uh, I always like the German term for this, it's called uh, Vergangenheitsbewältigung. It's a very powerful term. It's, it's about coming to terms with the past. It's a process. It's a process. It's not an endpoint. It's, it's a constant process. And of course, the Germans have been engaged in this for many decades now um, and have therefore unsurprisingly also developed very interesting theoretical works on, on this. So, um, so just a brief comparison of these different groups of victims. How have they fared in these contemporary campaigns? Um, the victims of the Kinder der Landstraße, so the Jenish, uh, they created in 1986 uh, an activist uh, organization called Nashat Jenische, that literally means um, uh, rise up Jenish or um, uh, become reborn. So, um, so that's a sort of uh, yeah, an activist organization. Um, they formulated a certain number of uh, reparative justice claims, uh, ranging from acknowledgement of the historic wrongs of which there were victims to claims for financial compensation, but also to claims which are very specific to the Yenish, and that is the claim for family reunification. Because in their case, very often those children, uh, particularly when they were very young, when they were taken very young, uh, were not taught that their parents were Yenish. So they were often, for, particularly, particularly in the case of babies, when they would be taken away as babies, they were often told that their parents had died 
and they were not told that they that their parents were of Viennese origin. So what we get in the nineteen in the late nineteen seventies, uh, sorry, in the early nineteen seventies and nineteen uh, eighties, when there's a huge uh, media um, uh, debate about uh, about this program, and which leads to a national debate about this, we also uh, witness uh, a, a great psychological shock to uh, hundreds of adults who, at the time, for the first time in their lives realized that they were actually Yenish, that they were of Yenish origin, which had never been told. And not only that, but they were of Yenish origin in a country which had labeled Yenish as second, uh, as, as not even citizens, I wouldn't even say second class citizens, I would say as non-citizens, as racially inferior, uh, as prone to criminality, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so this was really a, a collective trauma. So family reunification and uh, also trauma support for, for the victims of these practices loomed very high on the agenda of these activist um, uh, groups and, and, uh, and activist individuals. In 1998, an official gov critical government report comes out, um, produced by uh, critical Swiss historians, Lime Cooper, May and Sabonier, which was followed by, uh, which was accompanied by uh, a historic apology by the then president uh, of the Swiss Confederation, Ruth Dreyfus, who spoke of a, a grave injustice and uh, who described the Kinder de Landstrafe as one of the darkest chapters of Swiss modern history. So that was a very powerful moment, very unusual in Swiss history until then to see the president of, this was really a first to have the president of the, the, of the country recognize this. Uh, Ruth Dreyfus was the first Jewish president of um, the Swiss Confederation in a country that had um, uh, treated Jewish refugees in, a, in an extremely uh, uh, problematic way. That's another another analysis to do, and another that would be the subject of another another story uh, or another presentation. But that that no doubt played the role, and that, that made also the apology even even more powerful and even more of a historic moment coming coming from her. Um, so, with respect to uh, to these uh, victims of eugenic practices, they did. Um, uh, obtain some financial um, um, this, yeah, compensation. The, the term compensation, sorry, I'll just go back to the slide. The term compensation here is problematic, of course, but they, turn, they obtained certain uh, financial sums uh, for some of the victims. They, uh, they certainly uh, obtained this, for the time, very spectacular uh, public acknowledgement and apology. Uh, and um, the possibility for family reunification and uh, access to files, etc. Um, the victims of eugenic sterilizations, uh, which made their compensation plans pretty much at the same time in 1999, uh, did not uh, were not successful. So their claims were rejected by Parliament in 2004. And um, Natalia Girodetti uh, has um, produced a very interesting analysis of the arguments that were put forward by the Swiss Parliament at the time um, in her article, Whose Reparation Claims Count, where she points out that there were three main arguments. And those of you, and there are many, no doubt, who, have, who are also engaged in activist campaigns of all sorts of different natures, you will recognize some of these tropes because some of these are, are very common tropes that uh, organizations or the state uses to delegitimize activist claims also on totally different topic, topics. So the first one was that the federal state, this is the first one is a bit specific to the Swiss context. The first one is to say that the federal state uh, of today should not have any legal responsibility for what may have happened in the past. So it's sort of the legal argument about whether the state today should be, re may, be made responsible for the actions of the state in the past. The Swiss specificity is that many of the sterilizations in the Swiss context took place actually outside of any legal framework. So that made it even more complicated because uh, from the moment that um, sterilizations were carried out outside, or there, there was never a national sterilization law, for example, in the Swiss case, only one in, in one particular canton. And that was later used by the federal state to say, but therefore we are not responsible. We don't need to offer any compensation because it wasn't us, right? This was you know, different cantons doing this and often outside of any legal framework. So that was the first, uh, the first argument. The second one is, you know, very usual trope, don't judge the past through the present. So here, um, from, from the point of view of contemporary notions of sexual rights and sexual freedoms, um, the, the Swiss parliament argued that, uh, or the Swiss federal council, the Swiss government argued that we shouldn't apply those notions of sexual rights to, to the past. Uh, 
And the third one uh, is to some extent quite interesting that that was used so openly. <laughs> that the, the third argument was the argument of the slippery slope. The, the, the fact that it said, as it was said explicitly in Parliament, the fact that it set a dangerous precedent for other categories of victims, that if they gave money to this, if they gave, for example, financial compensation to this particular category of, um, of victims, then what about all these other categories of victims of the of practice of the Swiss state, in particular, the Verdinkinder? And in that sense, of course, they were completely right, because soon after, the Verdinkinder also launched, launched their own campaign for compensation. So, um, but, it, but I find it interesting that that argument was used so openly and that it was seen as legitimate to use that argument, right? That's to say that there are many other victims, uh, so therefore we shouldn't pay out anything, right? Um, so that's, that's interesting. Usually that's done in a more euphemistic way or, or you know, in, in, in many other countries, they've tried to stay away from that kind of argument because it involves actually a, an implicit recognition of those other categories of victims. Um, so indeed, uh, a few a few years later, um, a campaign was launched for recognition of victims of these non-eugenic uh, child removals by the state, the Verdinkinder. That was um, that gave rise to also an official apology by federal counsel Simonetta to Somaruga, um, who used interesting language when she made the apology. She said, "This is not so much about victims as uh, victims as and perpetrators. It's about us all." Um, and uh, this, the campaign also gave rise to uh, all sorts of measures, including some financial um, sums which were allocated to, to, to victims of forced placement of, um, of, of these children. Uh, but here the um, Swiss authorities pointedly refused to speak of uh, compensation, so they um, did not use the term compensation uh, to, to, to describe these sums, but they used the term solidarity. So they presented it as this is part of a form of solidarity between Swiss citizens, where, of course, through tax money, um, the, the Swiss nation uh, pays out money to individual victims from uh, of, of, of these practices. Um, so the big question here is why the difference? Why the difference between these different categories of victims? So uh, the Yenish children got some, and, and here I should also immediately say that's not to say that either the Verdin Kinder or the Yenish uh, children who were placed uh, were in any way entirely compensated or that reparative justice was fully achieved. So there's of course lots of limits about what they did obtain. But there was there was uh, some success in the in their campaign, whereas in the case of the the, the women who were victims of forced sterilization, uh, there was um, that that didn't happen. So the big question is why the difference? And here I'm really I'm really speculating. So in the case, I think there's part of an answer in in the wording of this official apology here. So um, to say that it's about us all, the Verdinkin that got the most public support. So this was really the notion that anyone in Switzerland could become poor. Uh, anyone in Switzerland could, you know, if through the accidents of life, uh, could fall into, into poverty. The Verdinkinder were not in themselves racialized. So this really was the idea of these are you know, proper uh, Swiss families whose children were taken away by the state and placed uh, um, and put to work. Um, and there was an enormous, enormous a groundswell of public sympathy towards them. And I'm not saying for a second that they did not deserve it. So it is not about you know uh, withdrawing or hierarchizing uh, suffering our, our, our ourselves. Uh, but um, the the difference with women victims of eugenic sterilization is really quite quite strong. And uh, yeah, I'm really speculating, but I would love to hear what other people think of that. Uh, in the Yenish case, it was also children. So the children were were seen as you know the, their their statushood as victims were was acknowledged but not the parents. So the Yenish parents were not compensated. It was the children who were compensated, not the parents. Uh, so here again, we have this no wider notion of children as, as entering more easily into the category, category of innocent victims, right? Um, whereas racialized, inferiorized adults uh, are much less easily recognized in terms of their, their victimhood, as are sterilized women 
who were uh, sterilized of, after being labeled as mentally, as morally defect, uh, uh, as morally degenerate. Uh, let's not forget that the vast majority of women who were forcibly sterilized, uh, and by this I mean who were sterilized without their consent in the Swiss context on eugenic grounds, were single mothers. So therefore they were de by definition culpable. They were not innocent victims. Right? They don't easily enter into that category of innocent victims. And they did not manage to mobilize the kind of public support that was needed to push through uh, or to motivate at least parliament to, uh, towards taking action. So in other words, what, what, uh, and I want to conclude on, on that point, um, from the notion of reproductive justice, of course, we learn to uh, conceptualize reproductive violence as operating against, uh, sorry, as operating along uh, racialized class, gender, and sexual lines, right? So reproductive violence itself operates uh, along these lines. We see that with the eugenic victims, we see particularly with victims of sterilization, the underclasses, uh, racialized categories such as the Yenish, um, um, and, and uh, uh, women who are seen as sexually promiscuous, uh, nymphomaniacs, that was the official label used at the time, etc. So the reproductive violence itself Operates against uh, operates along those lines, and that's what we, uh, what the critical power of a concept like reproductive uh, justice helps us to conceptualize. But when we look at the process of reproductive justice, we find that these processes are also implemented and also resisted along racialized, class, gender, and sexual lines. So we find these same fault lines reappearing in the contemporary processes, um, whereby some groups are. Uh, more easily recognized or more fully recognized, or at least part, part, partially recognized as victims and, and others are not. Um, and to finish on one, one more positive note, I'm just going to finish on one slide of the Kinder de Lange, uh, sorry, of the Verdien Kinder. So this is a photo of, you know, with the, the two people here on the left, uh, who are former Verdien Kinder, who are victims of these uh, child placement programs. So I want to finish by again saying, that's not to say at all that I do not have any intention to contest their, their victimhood. That's not what the point of what I'm doing today. But the point was to try to think a little bit more critically about these hierarchies um, and how they play out uh, in processes of recognition or, or non-recognition, um, uh, which, uh, which is an important um, set of debate which the Swiss, uh, which in the Swiss context is, is being conducted really in the last uh, two, two decades and is intensifying actually in, in recent years. So I want to finish on that and thanks so much for for listening. Um, thank you very much uh, for speaking with us today, Veronique. And again, I wanted to apologize for everything that happened. Um, so I have a couple of questions like myself, uh, but I first wanted to open up the floor uh, to see if anyone um, else have a, have a question. Okay, well, they warm up. Um, so um, I, I wanted to ask first about uh, something that you mentioned about eugenic feminism uh, and how like uh, different like women were very like involved in ideas of eugenics, which was not very common at the time. And I was wondering if they would use the label eugenic feminism or if they had other terms to refer to this woman that were in favor to like with eugenic ideas. Yes, this is something which I, I didn't uh, develop much, uh, much in my talk today, but uh, it's one of the interesting aspects of the Swiss case that eugenics really offered uh, women, uh, uh, I would say bourgeois women, uh, an active role in the implementation of eugenic policies, which um, was an, uh, uh, in, at a time when the political arena was totally uh, close to them. Uh, so what we find in the implementation of eugenic policies, for example, uh, this is something which I haven't talked about, but uh, in, some, in some of the big cities in, in uh, Switzerland, they set up eugenic advice bureaus where uh, citizens could come and ask for advice on you know, who, they, who they wanted to marry uh, according to eugenic criteria. And uh, in those advice bureaus, for example, we find that bourgeois women played quite an important role. We also see it uh, in terms of uh, teachers in schools uh, teaching these eugenic materials. Um, so eugenics actually offered scope for agency on the part of women. 
not all of these women were necessarily feminist. In addition, we see that many women's movements at the time, and that's something which is not specifically Swiss, that we also see in other countries, that many women's movements at the time also adopted eugenic ideas, promoted eugenic ideas. Um, and, and in that respect, we certainly saw eugenic feminists who would call themselves, I mean, depending on which language, uh, in Switzerland there were, there were, of course, four languages at the time. Uh, the, 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 word, the word feminist, as, as is still the case now, but um, the, the word feminist was... Uh, less used than the word women. So, for example, in, in the German, you would talk about Frauenbewegung, so the you know movement of, of women, and most of the of Frauenverein. So it's mostly organizations of women, but these really were feminist organizations. So, uh, and and many of them were uh, really very sympathetic towards uh, towards eugenics, uh, and were promoting eugenic ideas. So there were also, in that sense, really political actors. People like Forel worked with them. Uh, people. People like Forel were actually really, or I should say specifically Forel, because there were not that many high profile uh, political figures such as him. He heavily promoted also um, uh, the accession of women to political rights, for example. He was amongst the few um, uh, high profile Swiss uh, political public figures at the time, uh, male political figures who promoted the right to vote for women, which would take another, another 70 years uh, to, to happen, of course. Thank you very much. Uh, Priyanka, you had a question. Uh, you're muted. Sorry about that. So uh, my name is Priyanka and um, I have been, so I, I was invited to this by Professor Alison Bash, but thanks very much yeah. for this, this fantastic talk. Um, I, I work in um, India, particularly with women who are choosing hysterectomy. So, uh, uh, Usually we call them daily laborers in India, so it's a, a very low income community. And I, I was slightly overwhelmed in fact, because essentially everything that you spoke of uh, that Rachel also touched upon, which you called uh, it's a form of feminism or at the very least a form of female emancipation of exercising financial agency and sexual agency. It's happening in India at the moment as we speak, like decades apart, we have somehow, um, the low income uh, group in India have somehow come at this point where they have slowly internalized this idea of modifying their bodies so that, um, you know, they, they would not be at the mercies of their reproductive system. Uh, this is their um, ethic view, like an internal view, whereas the external bourgeois view is we want less women, uh, less children from these particular women because they are contaminating the, the, the nation's march towards modernity. You know, too many poor children to too many born to too many poor women. So there's, there seems to be this sort of an, um, an understanding between the bourgeois policymakers and the educators. And uh, so their motivations are different, but they have convinced the women that it is in their own best interests to kind of access, um, like abortions is, is messy and it can be emotionally very hard. So why don't these women just go and hysterectomize themselves as quickly as possible? So women are accessing hysterectomy as young as 22, 23, with absolutely devastating um, biological effects on their bodies that they're not told of at all. So is, is this uh, a phenomenon that has been, that, that you have noticed yourself, that women are being given wrong information so that they can sort of uh, sterilize themselves and um, then on it becomes a personal medical burden and not a, a state a supported medical burden on these women. Yeah, so. it's, it's extremely interesting what, you, what you're describing here. Um, the this, this Swiss case is very different in the sense that um, in the historic case I'm talking about, it yes. was actually not uh, in the majority of cases, the women who were sterilized against their consent did not have um, power of attorney. They were in the majority of cases already under some form of guardianship. Okay. And that meant legally that they were under the guardianship of, for example, the local priest or the local teacher or their father or, you know, uh, another another man um, or a doctor. Uh, and that means that they would take the decision for them. Um, so so that that is that is also a problem in terms of how do we know what they made of it all, yes. right? Uh, so so we see we see some of their own opinions come up in, in the files when they are quoted by the doctors who prepared the files. Uh, but on, on, on the whole, they did not have the power to make those decisions for themselves. 
um, was this so, it, yes. Sorry. No, so this process of like manufacturing consent amongst themselves was not necessary because they were it, already. It was not. It was not necessary because the situation, um, the authorities did not need their consent. Um, they could do it without it, and they did without it. Um, Thank you. <laughs> it's even more <laughs> horrifying. But... Yeah. No. It is. It is. That's that is also but, yes. why why this is such a shocking. You know, shocking situation. Yes. So this this was on the whole not a program where you know the victims that we're talking about on the whole were not victims who were talked into doing it, who were talked into thinking it was in their own interest. But there were um, in the, for the vast majority cases where uh, they were subjected to to sterilization against their 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 own will uh, by the legal consent uh, of uh, the, their their male guardians. Um, so, which is uh, yeah, much more extreme situation than, than what you're describing, but that makes your situation all the more interesting, actually. <laughs> and also slightly horrifying because, you know, later when they have complications, the doctors uh, feel free to tell them, well, who asked you to yeah, you know, yeah, you decide did, on you a hysterectomy? You decided it. Yeah, yeah you decided. So it's, it's yeah. agency yeah. can be a very dicey thing. Yes. I mean, <laughs> this is a situation where the notion of reproductive freedom also can have you know, yes, exactly. Uh, like, are we in a situation where there was full reproductive freedom or not? Yes. Um, Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Um, is there any other uh, questions? Um, I have one actually. Yeah. Uh, so you you talked about like the fact that like this like would also happened in the 70s and 80s and it was until the 90s that there were like different activist groups that started uh like asking for like not reparations like they used uh compensation like that's the word that they use right um and i was wondering if this activist groups like had other like contact with like other like activist movements like for example like in the us that it's like so much more recent like the fact that like they're bringing up like uh ideas about like reparation or compensation or like even solidarity uh so i was wondering if they had any connections with other places in europe or outside of europe yes it's an extremely uh, uh important question um at the moment i'm doing a, a research project on the campaign by the verdien kinder so this last this last campaign and we've really been struck with um, we've been doing interviews with uh, the main drivers of this campaign, the main activists who are now on the whole in their, for the youngest, they're in the 60s, for the oldest, they're in their 80s. They were formerly placed children who later became political activists and, you know, very prominent in this, in this campaign. And we've been struck with how few international contacts they had, they actually had built up, like hardly any of them had been liaising with other activist groups in, in other countries. And that's, that's really interesting and, and quite puzzling. Because um, of course it, it, it could be very useful to learn from similar campaigns. There have been many campaigns for compensation of placed children, for example, in Australia or in Canada, uh, which have preceded this, this Swiss campaign. And um, uh, they could certainly have, have exchanged information and have learned from them. The exception of that is um, the Yenish. And uh, one of the um, very interesting things that we found in this study is that we found that Amongst this category of the Verdien Kinder, so the children who were forcibly placed and who were then compensated, well, not using the term compensation as an official term, but who, who did receive financial uh, uh, compensation as a Verdien Kind, some of these uh, persons were also victims of forced, had been also victims of forced sterilization, who had been denied compensation in that, from that point of view of victimhood. Um, and some of them are also Yenish. So, so um, when we interviewed the Yenish uh, activist, there it was completely different. They've been liaising for a long time um, with other campaigns in other countries. And also, and, and part of that is also, of course, very understandable because the Yenish themselves are, are, are transnational. So they've been constantly, they're much more aware of what's happening in Germany, in the Netherlands, in, in Austria, because they're there as well. They are also constantly moving around and the community itself is there as well. Uh, so they were really very different from both the victims of uh, eugenic sterilizations and, and the sort of other categories of Verdien Kinder. Um, 
And that's another thing that I was thinking about, like the malleability of like the concept like race and like how this idea of like the betterment of the race, like in terms of like eugenic ideas, like all throughout the 20th century, like how it like changes, like very similar to what you were talking like at the beginning of the presentation with like uh, mental health and feeble mindedness and all of this, like race, like in the travel air community, like, like, like was like had a very different meaning. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on like this like idea of like race and what did they mean and how did they use it like for eugenic purposes? Um, you mean how the, how the authorities used it? Yeah. Yes, how the authorities use it. So, so well, they, they really presented, I mean, in the 1920s, uh, Swiss psychiatrists uh, who were uh, uh, the, the most main racial theorists in, in the Swiss case, uh, psychiatrists and anthropologists, uh, in, in their writings, they really presented the Yenis as, as, as a biological race, right? as a bi biologically different race. Uh, of course, the notion of race was much more fluid at the time. So they also presented Italians as a different race, right? as somewhat inferior uh, to, to, to the Swiss. And within the Swiss context, where you have one Italian speaking province and many German speaking pro uh, um, speaking provinces and some French speaking provinces, there was also this hierarchization where the population of the Italian speaking province was seen as somewhat inferior to the other categories of Swiss, even though they were all Swiss. So, um, so the notion of race was certainly in that sense much more fluid uh, than um, the way it is used by um, within, within particularly racist discourse today. Uh, when who is meant with, uh, in, who started by racialization discourses is, is uh, much more limited. Um, so those were fluid concepts. Um, and at the same time, they were really uh, hard at the time, right? They were, they were fluid in the sense that they, they were the categories that were covered by the notion of uh, race and that were racialized were um, much more diverse than nowadays. But th those categories in themselves were portrayed as fundamentally biologically uh, an inferior race, uh, as in the case of the of the Yenish. So in that sense, it was it was not fluid. In that sense, it was a hard discourse. Thank you very much. And another thing that I was thinking is that, like you know, like despite the common belief that eugenics completely ceased to exist, like in 1945, like what your like like project brings together is to see like how it not only like in terms of like eugenic practices and ideas it not only continues well after like 1945 but even like the struggles like finding like reparations or compensations are so hard to get because people don't see it as a problem at all um so even though it's very important especially after we've been hacked we see that it is a, indeed a sensitive issue and it's something that like should be regarded as a contemporary issue as well Yes, and you've seen that in your own in your own research as, as well, Rachel. That you know when people out, I mean, people who don't work on this kind of topic see this as certainly having ended in 1945, right? <laughs> so, so all of the practices we're talking about today, from the from the placement of the Yenish children, which was partly eugenically motivated, to the forced sterilizations, took place until the 1970s. Um, so, so these are much more recent than people might think. Uh, and that's also why we're still in an activist moment, um, because the victims are still there. They're still with us. Yeah, no, definitely. And even now that like people are advocating for eugenic ideas, like even today in 2022. Julieta, exactly. you had a question. Yes, uh, thanks, Veronique, for such an insightful presentation. I really like it, um, especially this was a case that I wasn't really um, I didn't know much about, so thanks for sharing this with us. <laughs> I have two questions for you. The first one is I would like to know a little bit more of how the campaigns for reparations envision this idea of reparation. Like what, what, what did it mean or what does it mean to repair someone who was a victim of forced sterilization or child removal, for example? Because I assume that it's not simply an economic compensation or receiving an amount of money in compensation for this form of harm, but what else do they claim or what else do they want to see as a form of reparation? Um, and the second one is, um, so you, you told us that the, um, that the, the, the compensation plan for victims of forced sterilization was rejected in 1999. And I would like to know if there are current uh, 
demand to revoke this decision um, you know, among uh, victims of forced sterilization and how are they framing it, considering these two reasons, the three reasons that you described that um, there was no legal responsibility of the federal state, that we could not use the framework of reproductive rights, you know, retroactively. Um, so, so I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit more of uh, if something else is happening around this case. Yes, I, I will start with the, with, the, with the second question, which I can answer more, more briefly. Um, at the moment, there's no sign of an organized movement. And I think part of that, even the first one, was, was very weak in terms of numbers. And I think that has to do with the social stigma. Of the, of the situation uh, of, of having been a victim of forced sterilization where there's still there's still today is a social stigma uh, around that which really stopped people from coming forward and from creating a strong numerically strong strong movement so um so most activists that we interviewed for the verdien kinder uh, study um we we found victims of forced sterilization who had been engaged in this first campaign and there certainly is an enormous bitterness about uh, the, the irony of the fact that now they're getting compensation, but for a different aspect of their experience and not, not for that aspect, uh, which they themselves see as, as of course, uh, similarly traumatic. But um, even amongst these most sort of radical uh, public figures of, of this first movement, I, I did not detect uh, any desire to try again. And I think that's partly to do with um, an assessment, which is probably correct, that the political opportunity structure is, is closed. At the moment, that they, they wouldn't get anywhere. Sadly, very sadly, um, but I think that's that's what happens. Uh, the question of the forms of rep reparative justice. You're you're completely right. Um, the, all of these all of these campaigns have uh, made different types of, of requests. I spoke a little bit about the specificity of the family re reunification for for the Yenis, for example, which was a particular issue issue for them. Uh, for the Verdinkin there. Um, they they certainly asked for for financial help from the state. Um, they uh, the 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 kind of demands that they made was um, uh, formulated in dialogue with the Swiss state in the context of a round table. So in the context of a round table, there was a dialogue between Swiss authorities and representatives of different categories of victims uh, of of these different practices, where they together came up with a certain number of. Uh, propositions and, and, and uh, practical policies. And those involve also, for example, setting up uh, a, a support network of uh, uh, where people can, can ask, uh, can, can uh, receive um, psych psychological or even psychiatric support. Because of course, what happened to many of the Verdien Kinder is that many of, the, of these Verdien Kinder were not all, I mean, yeah, we, we can't generalize too much. I mean, some of them had a wonderful time, ended up in foster families who were lovely with them and had great careers afterwards. Many others ended up being victims of sexual abuse, victims of other forms of physical abuse, um, didn't receive an education, um, were destroyed uh, psych psychologically. So we also find a lot of a lot of these victims of the child placements of the Verdien Kinder uh, ended up living their whole lives um, on, on very meager um, disability benefits and being seriously, seriously poor um, and having been so all, all their lives. So the financial the financial aspect was very important to them. They really needed that money. And there's, of course, as in any uh, campaign. The outcome of, of this was that um, they did receive a certain sum, which was about trying to quickly calculate in, in, in pounds, it would be about 15,000, 16,000 Swiss, uh, 15,000, 16,000 British pounds. Of course, those are small sums for having lost an entire an entire life, a chance at an education, a chance at a career. So, so those, so the amount of um, money is contested. That's also why the Swiss state insists it's a solidarity fund and not a compensation because that uh, uh, removes some of the, uh, potentially removes some of the contestation of that this somehow makes up, of the claim that this somehow makes up for the suffering. But what we found in the interviews, and I don't want to say for a second that uh, the public apology was more important than the money. Uh, in fact, I started with explaining all of this to explain that the money really is important and they really need it. And it's really appreciated and they really need more than that. Um, but we also found that the moment of official apology by um, uh, the Swiss government meant so much to them. 
And that, that was interesting because I, I had somehow expected maybe more cynicism about it or more criticism about it. Maybe more of, um, yeah, well, they apologize, but they don't want to give us other things. And actually, it was clear. We didn't have a single person who didn't say this was one of the most important days of, in their life to hear the official representative of the Swiss state apologize. So, um, so, so that made me actually think about ourselves because as, as social scientists, we're, we're critical, we develop critical analysis. So, you know, we, we have sometimes this tendency of being quite cynical about, about gestures like that. We can say, well, it's a gesture on the, on the part of the state, which, you know, makes up for not, not doing other things, which would be really also needed. Uh, but at the, at the level of the subjective experience of the event, this clearly meant a lot. And this was definitely extremely high on their agenda. They wanted acknowledgement of the suffering. And that was so important to get that um, and really change the, the way they see themselves and the way they see their, their place in society today. Um, yeah. yeah, I think that's very important because you're getting an, at a you know, key thing because in my research in Peru, for example, we see that some of the demands are around economic compensation, but at the same time, there is a whole politics around money. Um, on the one hand, for example, human rights organizations, really want to downplay the demand for economic compensations because they they think well this can be stigmatizing people can especially the political party that was in charge of this program in the 1990s have used this to discredit some of the victims claims to say well they just want money that's all they want exactly. these people are just gold diggers they just want money um and at the same time then the complexity of money is how you evaluate harm Right, and how you compensate for a harm that is not something that happened, let's say, 30, 40 years ago, but it's something that unfolds constantly in people's lives um, and compounds with other forms of exclusion like poverty, racism, sexism. So it's, it's a really interesting uh, debate, I think, uh, for social sciences. So, so yeah, I, I was interested in, in that question. So thanks for sharing. Thank you for sharing your, your um uh, experiences as well. Um, Sophia, you had a question. Hi, Veronique. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, so I have a question and it's, it's connected to notions of victimhood and what you've talked about uh, recently on reparation. And it's um, kind of the idea around uh, reproductive injustice and uh, and the uh, kind of calls for no repetition, uh, which is something that in Spanish is very like, it comes with reparation and no repetition, but it doesn't happen again in the future. And I wonder how this uh, thing that happened in the past is being uh, revised in a way that is not repeated in the present in other in other iterations or in other versions of it, uh, particularly with kind of childhood policies, uh, gender policies and reproductive policies, but also migration, uh, specifically in connection to racism. Yes, I mean, those, those are extremely important questions. And when we look at the language used, the wording used in the official policy, there's always this moment of never again, Right, it takes different forms in the in the language, but it's always there. There is also this looking forward to the future, um, already in the the official policies from from the state authorities. And um, to answer your question, I think it's a very complex question. And um, uh, the this as part actually of the reparation uh, claims that were asked by the activists of the Verdien Kinder campaign and also by the victims of eugenics, by the way. Um, there's been a lot of research on this topic, so this was actually also, this um, is something I forgot to say before in, in um, reaction to Julieta's question, that amongst the things they were asking for is they wanted research, they wanted research on what happened, they wanted more knowledge about what happened, also as part of this official public recognition and, and they wanted their stories to be heard, they wanted their stories to be told, they wanted to be interviewed, they wanted to have researchers come and study them. Um, so uh, as part of that, both on eugenics, interestingly, in this case, uh, in that sense, they did um, uh, something did happen. And also with respect to the Verdientine and with respect to the Yenish, the Swiss state also freed up quite important research budgets to, to study these topics. Um, and um, 
uh, in that context, there's at the moment an interesting national research program uh, assess, doing precisely what you're su suggesting, which is analyzing, uh, these are mostly social scientists, not historians, so social and political scientists who are analyzing current policies from the point of view of uh, precisely the kind of questions that um, the, the, that the whole rep reparative justice campaigns were about. And they're also, they, they, they really are genuinely, genuinely critical. They also are looking at, for example, migrants without, without documents, undocumented migrants. They are looking at uh, the way refugees are being treated. They are looking at uh, current policies of child placement, uh, which are of course still, still very, um, uh, very much on, ongoing. Um, that will then give rise to a political moment. And that's, of course, when the interesting moment happens, <laughs> right? So that's in the end up to Parliament. Uh, and um, so, so that's not to say that um, uh, the Swiss state will then necessarily um, ensure that none of this will ever happen again. But the, the way it's organized in the Swiss case is that the national research programs are meant to make recommendations. So this is where we social scientists can be critical we can be generally critical and we can make recommendations, which parliament has the obligation to debate. Now, of course, from then on, it's the parties that are elected in parliament that will decide what to do with it. So that there's no, of course, guarantee that any of our recommendations will be, will be actually carried out. Um, but at least there's a debate about it. And there's certainly a lot of scrutiny at the moment. Um, as there is in the UK, by the way, there's also the last few years, there's been quite a lot of scrutiny of uh, child placement policies, which I haven't seen before to quite to this extent. Um. Thanks. Um, so before we wrap up, I have one final question. So uh, you mentioned that like children are seen as like worthy of compensation and then like parents are not. Is this because like parents even to this day are, see like, are seen as degenerate in the very eugenic sense? I think with the with the Yenish, by the time the activist claims arose, it was less about race at that time. Now we're talking about the early 1970s. At that moment, I think it was less about race as about their criminalization. So the, the stigmatization of the Yenish by that stage, I mean, already in the 1920s when they were heavily racialized, they were presented as biologically more inclined to be criminals, to be, and, and of course, uh, they often ended up in prisons, they often end up being uh, incarcerated in ju juvenile institutions because of the use that they were given, right? So they were exploited, abused often in, in uh, countryside settings, therefore more likely to revolt or to engage in small forms of criminality, therefore more likely, also more under surveillance from the police, from the local police and the authorities, therefore more likely to end up in prison. I don't need, I don't need to explain those mechanisms to this, to this audience. So that was of course seen in the, in, at, in the, eugenic, in, in the eugenic moment as confirmation of the, of the accuracy of the eugenic uh, and racial theories. By the 1970s, it was more about this, I mean, this, this discourse of criminalization stuck. So they were seen as, you know, people you can't trust, um, they steal your children. Ironically, ironically, that's one of the main stereotypes about the Yenish in Switzerland, that they steal your children. That's a historic, um, you know, one of, one of the great ironies of this kind of um, st uh, stigmatizing rhetoric, but also they steal to core. So they steal, you know, anything at all. Um, so, uh, so this um, portrayal as the Yenish, they, they were not portrayed in a symp sympathetic way as people that um, should be given sympathy and support. They were seen as threatening, uh, particularly those who were still traveling, which is now a much smaller group. There are still Yenish traveling, but they're a much smaller group. They're the ones that you see standing in caravans in between two highways, because those are the only, you know, they're now only allowed to stay in particular spots which they have to leave spotlessly clean and they're always between highways and you know to make it as unattractive as possible for them to come so so the, there's still groups that are very much rejected uh, by society even today even after all of these campaigns and all of this public debate and this acknowledgement of the wrong done to the children they're still they're still um, very much stigmatized today uh, as they are in france and in other, other but there's more the, the roma it's a different different group but yeah it's very interesting because that same framing as like of criminalization um, is used for indigenous but, uh, like people in Mexico like throughout like the 20th century, especially when they started migrating from rural parts of like um, of Mexico to Mexico City. It's like a very similar 
I, did, uh, I didn't know that. That's fascinating. Yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, thank you very much for being with us today, like Vernik uh, and.